For today's video, I want to talk about how to cycle an aquarium using plants, but before we dive in, I do want to clarify what I mean by that, since it can be interpreted in two different ways. I'm not talking about cycling a planted tank that uses a traditional filter as its main source of microbial filtration. Instead, I'm focusing on setups where plants serve as a primary filtration system with microbes playing a supporting role. These tanks usually don't require a conventional filter to maintain the cycle and when planted correctly, the microbes will only play a very small role in the cycle. But if you are looking to cycle a tank that will include plants and use a traditional filter for microbial filtration as the main method for nutrient processing, I recommend checking out my article on the dark start method which I link in the description below. I want to quickly go over how this cycling method actually works because this is something that a lot of people get wrong when it comes to cycling aquariums with plants. The traditional cycling method relies on a filter and microbial filtration. In that specific setup, ammonia is produced via fish waste and decaying organics in the tank. Beneficial archaea and bacteria work together to convert toxic ammonia into toxic nitrite and then finally into the far less toxic nitrate. But this isn't how things work when we are cycling an aquarium using plants as a primary filter. There's actually a fourth nitrogen compound present in our aquariums called ammonium which forms shortly after ammonia appears. Thankfully, ammonium is far less toxic than ammonia and it's created by adding an extra hydrogen ion to the ammonia molecule. The balance between the toxic ammonia and far less toxic ammonium in your tank does depend largely on your specific tank's pH and water temperature as it is an ammonium to ammonia ratio that does need to be maintained and I link to a calculator in the video description that can help you work out your ratio. In a planted tank, we can take advantage of this by allowing our tank's pH and hydrogen ions to passively convert ammonia into ammonium, which plants then use directly as a nutrient source. As plants absorb the ammonium, more ammonia is passively converted into ammonium to maintain the ratio until eventually there's no ammonia left. Microorganisms still play a role in this system, but it is a secondary role and depending on the specific species of plants and how many you actually add to the tank, it can be a very small role. The main thing to realise with this specific cycling method is that plants do the bulk of the heavy lifting. But because the microorganisms can still play a small role, you may still see small amounts of nitrite and nitrate on your test kit during the initial cycling process. However, unlike a traditionally cycled tank where nitrate builds up and needs to be removed via water changes or converted into nitrogen gas by specialist bacteria, in a plant filtered tank, once the ammonia is used up, the plants shift their nitrogen preference over to nitrate and use that as a nutrient source helping to keep its levels in check. So moving on and I want to talk about the best live plants to cycle an aquarium because all plants are definitely not created equally when it comes to this type of tank. Technically all aquatic plants will absorb ammonium but this is a big area where a lot of people make a mistake and overlook a critical detail because the faster a plant grows the more ammonium it can absorb to support its rapid growth rate. That's why fast grown plants are often the go to choices for filterless setups where plants are relied on for filtration. These faster grown plants help to stabilise water parameters by quickly turning ammonium into plant mass but they also absorb a wide range of different TDS compounds as well, helping to prevent your TDS from constantly increasing in the tank. As a general rule of thumb, you'll want to focus on fast-grown stem, stolon, floating and emergent plants for this specific type of filtration system. Some of my personal favourites include Limnophila sesliflora, duckweed, most hygrophila species, water lettuce, Vallisneria, Rotola rotundifolia, Ludwigia, hornwort, Elodia and pearlweed. But there are plenty of other options out there and any plant with a fast growth rate will work well in this role. But I do want to offer a quick word of caution at the time of recording this video because AI tools are not reliable for correctly identifying fast grown aquarium plants. So always cross check any plant names suggested by AI with trusted human sources. 
I recently had someone reach out who'd relied on AI tools for their plant list and quickly ran into problems. Thankfully we were able to get some suitable plants in the tank and save it, but it might have been a total rescape if we didn't get that sorted quick enough. And just as a real life example of this, I asked Google Gemini for fast grown plant suggestions today and 9 of the 24 suggestions are notoriously slow grown plants including Java Fern, Anubias, Java Moss, Christmas Moss and even Marimor Moss Balls. Now I do have a dedicated article on the best plants for Wallstadt Method tanks that I link to in the description, but the ones I mentioned earlier in the video are perfectly fine. I also want to quickly touch on the differences between emergent, floating and submerged plants when it comes to cycling an aquarium with plants. Now there is some controversy over whether these plants will primarily absorb ammonium or nitrate as their primary nitrogen source, Personally, I do think they will take up ammonium first because it's a preferred nitrogen compound for plants. Once the ammonia levels are depleted, then I think they'll switch over to nitrate and use nitrate reduction to process that correctly internally. Now, emergent plants are currently less commonly used in aquarium setups, but they are rapidly gaining popularity in this type of filterless tank, which relies on a lot of plants to naturally purify the water. Although I have had some teething issues with my newest varieties of Tradescantia, I can't wait to see how these grow in, in the future as Tradescantia comes in a huge range of different colours so it can add some beautiful colours and leaf shapes above the waterline. And in case you're wondering, I'm using 3D planted plant holders from my friend who runs MMS Designs on Etsy and he ships worldwide and I'll link to them in the description. Next up are floating plants which rest on the water's surface and also have direct access to atmospheric CO2 giving them a fast growth rate making them excellent natural purifiers. I also have a dedicated article going over the best floating plants for aquariums that I link to in the description but here are my personal recommendations. I think that the best options are duckweed, spiridella, water lettuce and hornwort. Good secondary options that are still hardy but have a slightly slower growth rate include Salvinia and Amazon Frogbit which are still good options. Finally I would say Redroot Floaters can help but they do have the slowest growth rate out of any floating plant that I've personally tried to date so they will offer a smaller benefit than the other options. Finally we have submerged plants which grow entirely underwater. These rely on naturally occurring CO2 in the tank which can limit their growth rate depending on your specific setup compared to floating or emergent plants. Because of this you often need to plant them in larger numbers or prioritise faster grown submerged plants like Limnophila sessiliflora or various species of Hygrophila. Now I don't use Valacinaria myself and I have tried it and I want to try it again but I know a lot of people who have excellent results using Valacinaria as well. So moving on I want to quickly touch on how water temperature, pH, water flow and light and all play a role in this specific type of aquarium cycle. Although there is some flexibility if you are new to planted tanks I recommend setting your heat at 25 degrees celsius or 77 degrees fahrenheit. While cooler water temperatures can still work I do think that this is the sweet spot for optimal plant growth while also ensuring that most beneficial microorganisms that can help us with the cycle as a backup can still thrive in your tank. But be sure to double check the required water temperature requirements of the fish you intend to keep in the tank. For example I keep my better fish slightly warmer than that so I just turn the heater up accordingly and to date it hasn't caused any issues. Your water's pH, GH and KH can all have an impact on plant growth to some extent as well. For reference, my tap water has a pH of 6.4, a GH of 4 and a KH of 3. So with this water, plants like Limnophila sessiliflora and most Rotala species will grow perfectly well without issue. However, with my softer acidic water, most Hygrophila species do tend to take longer to establish themselves before their rapid growth rate kicks in, but I have friends with harder, more alkaline water, where their Hygrophila species outperform Limnophila sessiliflora. So you can tweak your plant selection depending on your personal water parameters, with something like Limnophila sessiliflora usually being better for soft water, and different types of Hygrophila potentially being better for hard water, and Rotala usually being good no matter what your water parameters are. 
but it is worth noting that lower pH also means more hydrogen ions in the tank which shifts the ammonia to ammonium balance in the favour of ammonia making it easier to suck that up by your plants. Now you can definitely cycle your tank using only passive water movement such as the convection currents from your heater. I've done this in one of my newest better fish tanks but it does definitely slow things down. I highly recommend adding some sort of active water flow whether it's from some type of small filter, a power head or even a small USB water pump that I personally use. Even a gentle water movement in the tank helps circulate the nutrients around the tank which forces them to come into contact with the plants more frequently so they can be absorbed and removed from the tank. I also want to quickly touch on lighting as it is essential for photosynthesis but luckily even affordable entry level modern LED lights are more than capable of supporting the growth rate of fast grown plants. I personally use affordable lighting on the majority of my tanks and it works perfectly well due to how powerful modern LED technology is. I will leave affiliate links to some of my favourite lights in the description as well as to an article on aquarium lighting options that I keep regularly updated as new models are released onto the market. So moving on and we finally get to the step by step guide on how to cycle an aquarium with plants but I do think a lot of the previously covered information is important to get this right. So we are going to start by adding our substrate and my personal favourites are either capped dirt such as a Wallstad method setup or a budget friendly aqua soil like fluval stratum but keep in mind fluval stratum's price does fluctuate a lot depending on your area and it can still be expensive in some places. You can add hardscapes such as rocks and driftwood if you like but I do try to keep it as minimal as possible because it takes up valuable planting space that could be better used by plants. That said, one popular exception that I use a lot in my tanks is lava rock because its porous structure can theoretically support an advanced nitrogen cycle providing surface area for specialist bacteria to help stabilise water parameters further. With this type of filtration and cycling method I plant heavily from day one usually aiming to cover at least 25% of the planting area with fast grown plants like the ones I covered earlier. I also add floating plants to the surface of the water too at least for the first couple of months until things stabilise and settle down. The rest of the planting area can be a mixture of slow grown decorative plants or some additional hardscape if you like but the key thing is to try and make sure you get at least 25% of the substrate covered in fast grown plants. If you're using a cap dirt substrate like the Wallstad method then the water soluble ammonia in the soil will naturally release into the water column helping to kickstart the cycle. If you've taken the aqua soil path then some aqua soils can release ammonia too but the more affordable types like fluval stratum that I personally use usually don't have that much ammonia in them. So in that case or if you're using an inert substrate I recommend dosing a small amount of an ammonia solution. I personally use Dr. Tim's ammonia solution but there's several brands available. But rather than dosing the typical 2 ppm guideline for a traditional dark start cycle with this I recommend going far lighter and dosing to a quarter of the recommended dose to bring the ammonia up to 0.5 ppm to avoid stressing your plants especially while they're becoming established. Now some people do prefer the fish in cycling method where you'll add fish to the tank from day one and generate ammonia naturally by feeding your fish but personally I'm not a fan of that method. So once you have an ammonia source in the tank be it leaking from the dirt in your cap dirt substrate an ammonia solution or by using a fish in cycle it's time to get a light on the tank so the plants can start photosynthesizing and growing. As I mentioned there's no need to buy an expensive light at all and the majority of my tanks use very affordable modern LED lights that grow plants perfectly fine. I set the lighting units in my fish room to 6 hours per day at maximum intensity using the built in timers but I do know people who use slightly lower intensities for 8, 10 or 12 hours per day without issue. Now this next step is optional but I do highly recommend adding a source of water flow to the tank either from a small nano filter, a power head or a USB water pump. This helps circulate the water in the tank so the excess toxins can come into contact with the plants more frequently and be absorbed as a nutrient source for growth. 
If you live in a cooler climate where temperatures dip below 22 degrees Celsius or 72 degrees Fahrenheit, it is best to add a heater and set it to at least that temperature or ideally 25 degrees Celsius or 77 degrees Fahrenheit. This will help prevent dormancy kicking in in the plants as well as support healthy microorganism growth in the tank for a healthy safe cycle. Once the tank is fully set up, I do personally like to test my water on a regular basis to track ammonia, nitrite and nitrate levels, but doing this once a week will still give you a good idea of what's happening. If you've planted heavily from the start, you might never see a detectable ammonia or nitrite reading on your test kit and this recently happened to one of my setups. It has so much Limnophila sesliflora and Rotala rotundifolia in the tank as well as Spiridella polyrhiza floating on the surface that the plants just absorbed all of the toxins and I've never once had a detectable nitrogen compound hit in here. Keep in mind capped dirt substrates can release other water soluble nutrients like copper which can be harmful to livestock in large amounts so I do personally like to still do water changes every two to three days for the first couple of weeks to keep things as safe as possible. But after those first couple of weeks, you'll know your tank is ready to stock once your ammonia and nitrite levels have been undetectable on your test kit for at least three days in a row. When it comes to stocking this type of tank, which is filtered via plants, I always aim for a light to moderate stocking level. A good guideline is to use the free AcAdvisor tool and aim to stock your aquarium to no more than 50% of its suggested capacity. This not only accounts for the space taken up by the plants, but it also reduces the bio load, giving your planted system the best chance to keep everything safe and stable. I'm a big fan of this cycling and filtration method, and I use it in the majority of my tanks now, and it works perfectly fine. But I do recommend you check your water parameters with a decent test kit at least once per month, just so you can keep an eye on the nitrogen compounds until the tank's more established and you have confidence in its ability to keep things safe. Moving on, I want to quickly touch on whether you still need a filter when cycling an aquarium using plants. While a plant-based cycling and filtration system can work perfectly fine without water flow, it does make things more challenging if you are brand new to the planted tank side of the hobby. Because of this, I usually recommend that beginners do add some source of water flow at least for the first couple of months with a filter being the optimal option because it can serve as a safety net. Some plants can struggle to establish themselves depending on your tank's water parameters, so having something in the tank that can act as a backup can just help keep things stable in the tank. That said, it really doesn't have to be anything fancy or expensive like a canister filter. The most affordable sponge filter that you can find in your area will work perfectly fine. Not only does the filter serve as a backup with microbial filtration, but it also generates water flow helping to move nutrients and waste products around the tank so the plants can absorb them more efficiently. If you do already have previous experience with aquariums, especially planted tanks, your chances of success without using a filter are significantly higher. In that case, you might not need a backup filter at all, and like I said, the majority of my tanks don't have filters in them anymore, but I am starting to use water pumps in a lot of them just for some active water circulation to keep things as safe and stable as possible. And in case you're wondering why I'm choosing to use a water pump for water circulation instead of a filter, it is due to several different reasons. The main one is that I see this is more of a test of skill to be able to do this kind of thing and it is something that I'm interested in, but water pumps also run on a USB port instead of a plug and I'm short on plug sockets in my tank. And on top of that, microbial filtration usually converts the nitrogen compounds into nitrate, which isn't the optimal nitrogen source for plants, so the plants need to waste energy on nitrate reduction to convert it back into ammonium, which can affect plant growth. I just want to quickly say I'm currently running four different monthly updated tank series for different aquariums using this method for cycling the tank and for filtration. They are completely over the shoulder leaving nothing out and the bad bits are included in there just to give a more realistic expectation of what to expect with this type of tank. The first one is already online for the first tank but the other three setup videos will be online shortly and then they'll all be updated monthly moving forward. Anyway guys that brings the video to an end, thanks for watching, I hope it's been helpful and good luck with your planted tanks.